Uh, what's up, of, man? One of the three musketeers. Where's your uh, Where's your hat? Where's your, where's your hat and sword? I got to uh, I, I got to give some credit to the stash inspiration. I just spoke to uh, Brian Wish. Yeah. And he has the full beard, so he is clearly winning in that game. But uh, I'm trying. I'm trying to get my own fair uh, fair share of the facial hair going. Man, this is awesome. Uh, awesome to chat with you, dude. Uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm recording video on this, right? I, I love it. I, I was hoping so. You know, this is, uh, what, what, are you, what are you implying, Brian? You don't like the stash? Come uh, on. I, I, <laughs> well, I think it's the stash coupled with the, uh, for those listening on audio, this? right? The, the, what, the what do you call this? Um, is that as a soul patch? Is that the correct term? I don't know which, which is the soul patch, which is like the goatee. If I had it connecting, that would be a goatee, but I can't do that physically. So I don't know what to call it. I have a hard time too. I actually shaved. Uh, I've been shaving a little bit because I'm like, you You're know, the thing good, is for friend. me, the, the beard just gets scratchy. I just can't. Oh. I go like this all the time. You're going to see me in the interview and I do this thing. I understand now why people used to think like this. I get it because I do it. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. This is new. I'm not sure how long it's going to be here but enjoy it while it is. We're all trying new things, right? We're <laughs> playing Amen. around. Dude, have you been, let's just roll into it. Let's just roll into the conversation. Be fun. Um, I love it. I'm in. I'm feeling great. You're the man. I'm so glad to be here. Dude, I'm, I'm pumped. Um, I'm, you know, obviously I'm a, I'm a next gen fan. G- give a, give the quick 30 seconds on next gen. I, I can't, I can't do it justice probably with the way I say it. So just a quick 30 seconds for folks that don't know what next gen is. You are not giving yourself enough credit, Brian, but I, I shall anyways. Um, Next Gen HQ is a business that empowers entrepreneurs to chase their wildest dreams. It's a crazy hard journey, as you know, Brian, as many of your listeners know, to pursue greatness in your own right. And we simply want to energize you with the momentum you need to level up, whatever that might mean for you. Right? For some people, that's uh, more personal, community building, a mentor maybe. Some people that could be a tangible resource, meeting an investor, a pitch competition, you name it. We want to be the avenue through which you can uh, find that and chase that momentum. Yeah. And you guys are definitely doing that. You know, it's interesting. I was talking with one of my mentors, you know, I met down here in Raleigh and uh, he's he's just a phenomenal guy. And I was talking with him the other day and we were trying to pinpoint like the, the characteristic and I was telling about the next gen group and everything. And you know what characteristic I came up with? I'm curious if you'll agree with this is every person in next gen at least that i've met and it's probably been hundreds of people now um the one word that i can kind of put all of them in is because they're so different is energized love 100 percent. would would you agree it's like they're all have this energy about like they they it's it's not just sitting kind of and and just kind of in the mud and kind of like eh, whatever life's happening like they're actually going out and and they're enthusiastic and energized about accomplishing whatever their mission is, right? And it may be different than the person next to them. 100%. I could not agree more, Brian. You hit the nail on the head. We energize entrepreneurs, right? That is our, our shtick, if you will. Uh, you talk about it in, in your podcast, on your website, in your description. You are helping people just get started to chase that, that goal, chase that dream. Yeah. What do you need to get out of bed every day after getting punched in the face 10 bajillion times yesterday? You need energy. And we all have it. We all feed off each other. That's why I think people like yourself are um, so so thrilled and enthralled by meeting other next geners because you are, are, yes, adding value to a conversation. But I have no doubt that you're walking away after a 20-minute mentor call feeling energized as well. It's a beautiful thing. It's like the cycle right. of momentum. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, I got to ask, let, let's start there is you guys started next gen. I think you were around 18, right? 17, 18. Is that right? Yes, 17, 18. Exactly. What was the original idea for NextGen? Was it what it is today or was it something completely different? Yes and no. So how NextGen looked at the time, 100 or 99.9% different. Um, At the core of the business, of the vision that my partner Justin and I uh, shared, not much has truly changed. Um, We maybe have improved our vocabulary, how we talk about it, what NextGen HQ looks like. Uh, we added the HQ. That's that's definitely new. But right. at, at that time, Brian, taking you back six years almost, um, we simply were looking for a resource that we ourselves wanted. So Justin and I had a previous small business. And I, I say small business, I should put some air quotes on that because to call it a business is uh, a, a little generous. But we had no clue 
which way was up. And we wanted help. We wanted to connect with other young people who were also chasing something different, right? working for themselves, pursuing a passion that maybe wasn't so popular in the classroom per se. And we couldn't really find that network that was going to push us in a way that next gen today, hopefully in a perfect world, members are pushing themselves, getting the resources, receiving the mentorship. And we went to dozens and dozens of conferences, great people, great networking opportunities, but everybody was at a level that we just couldn't really relate to. And in the spirit of being young and a little bit foolish and, and somewhat crazy, we said, let's go host a conference ourselves. We called it Next Gen Summit. And that was the first iteration of how, how Next Gen manifests. Um, today, we still have Next Gen Summit. It's still a huge part of what we do. We now have this robust online group. We now have various other activation and event products that we're pursuing and many more to come but they all stem from that core brand value, that brand promise, um, which our man, our shared uh, mentor and advisor and friend, Rich Keller, all, always talks about. We deliver moment, momentum, right? How we deliver that through what products, that will continue to change as it should. But if the momentum changes, we've screwed up. We've gone one step too far. Yeah, well, how, how did you, uh, remind me how you met Justin. Oh, I met Justin through a mutual friend who uh, went to high school with Justin. So one of my best buddies from sleepaway camp, I was over his house one day in Long Island and it was, I think a Friday, Saturday night. And he mentioned that a, another friend of his was having a house party actually in a garage, which Justin and I very recently pieced together. And he asked if I wanted to go. Said, yeah, sure. Let's go meet your friends. Sounds good. Senior year of high school, senior fall. And I go meet his, his buddies, none of which I had known before. And Justin is one of them. So we met, spoke for maybe two or three minutes. And there was just something different about the conversation, Brian. I think we all can relate to a time in our lives where we met somebody, not because it was the longest conversation, not even the best conversation, but you just click, right? You know what I'm talking about? And, and that was the case with Justin and myself. We didn't even stay in contact after that first, hey, what's up? How are you? Uh, but we, we crossed paths again about four or five months later in the spring. And that was when we actually got to spend a significant amount of time together and had about two or three hours just to talk and get to know each other. And that was when we realized truly that we were both chasing uh, similar questions. We were both asking uh, the same prompts and, and our thinking was very aligned. And um, I think we just hit it off in the sense that we don't know what the heck we, we wanna do together, but let's do something. We're too aligned not to, we're, we're both ambitious. Uh, let's see what the heck we got here. And that's what led to pursuing our first business, Students for Students. Where do you think that ambition came from? Was that a, was that a uh, nurture type thing? Was that a born with it quote in quotes that some people say? Where, where do you think that came from for you guys to be so ambitious at such a young age and, and wanting to kind of do your own thing? That's such a great question. And something that I have spent a decent amount of time thinking about Probably quick shout out because my mother is a psychologist by training. So obviously that is something that she is used to talking about. Um, so I, I think that it does stem from our families and to speak about my experience, um, my family, not that they put pressure on me to succeed or to you know, chase big dreams at all. They did not. Um, but they, they set the bar through uh, how they, treated my sister and myself, how they took care of us, how they prioritized family. And so in a way, Brian, I viewed uh, achieving, whether academically or in business or in sport, as a way of showing them that I appreciated the, the care through which they uh, raised us. And, and that I think is also shared with the Lafazan family and Justin and his experience. And, and not that we had this innate um, you know, drive to achieve for the sake of achieving, but we wanted to push ourselves. We wanted to see what we were capable of and to uh, get out there and learn a bunch. And when you're 17, 18, a lot of times that manifests through your SAT score, right? Um, the business world was new and that was not something that we had many role models to look up to, but there were a few and there were enough that showed us it was at least possible. And we continue to explore meeting folks like yourself or right? getting connected to the right mentors and friends who pushed us to continue to explore that path and I think it's just little by little, you know, 1% each day that does manifest and compound. And uh, next thing you know, we were launching and growing a business. 
Did you all seek out mentors or did you have a, you know, were introduced? I think if I remember Justin, like he was reaching out to folks, you know, to interview people and stuff like that to learn. But I, I, I'm always curious because I think a lot of people are, I know I was when I was a kid, very apprehensive to reach out to someone that's older, wiser, insert whatever word there. Right. And, and you're kind of scared because you're like, eh, well, they might say no, they might not. Why do they want to waste their time with me? So I'm, I'm just more curious if you've had, um, you know, some, some folks you've reached out to or were, were kind of almost pushed in that direction that helped. Definitely. Brian, I can so relate to the feeling that you brought up. Um, when you are young, when you're 17, 18 years old, maybe a first year student at a university, it is intimidating to send an email, make a call, go knock on a door for someone who is 30 or 40 years older than you perhaps, and has achieved massive success that you want to learn from. Um, and that did preclude me, especially at the beginning from perhaps reaching out to a few people that I know could have benefited me. Um, however, I want to credit Dan Fine in particular with a bit of advice he gave me my first year at school. Uh, he essentially said, you have something that is of value to every business person in the world. Whoever you want to meet from Mark Cuban to Rich Keller to you know, Brian and Droko, you, you name it, everyone can benefit from this thing you have, Dylan. It's like, what the heck? What do I have that can benefit all these people? It's like, you have a .edu email address. You are a university student, right? Everyone wants to connect with the young demographic, whether they want to sell their product to them, they want to hire them, you name There's any millions of reasons under the sun, but you have access and you can help them. So don't reach out to say how you want their help. Reach out to add value to them. And by doing so, yeah, maybe they might take you up on it and then you got to deliver, but I bet you they probably won't and you'll get connected with them anyways. Um, that was a bit of a reframe for me, Brian, on connecting. And I think that has held true even to this date where when I am trying to get in touch with somebody, of course, you know, I'm not just sending cold emails left and right. I'm trying to go through networks and build relationships and never for just you know, transactional purposes, but I'm always leading with value. And I think there, it's noticeable when you actually mean it. And when you're just saying it, you know, for the sake of an email sign off <laughs> to joke around. Um, but if you lead with value, you might not always get a response, but you are going to way tremendously increase the likelihood that, that person responds to your email and actually ends up offering you what you were looking for in the first place. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting thought. And it's, I think that's good. I mean, a lot of folks do that naturally probably, but you don't really think about you know, because sometimes it's always like, oh, I'm asking for something instead of actually right. that, that, that go giver mentality, you know, which, which is basically right. what you're talking about, you know, 100%. what, um, what, uh, so I want to talk about the support systems a little bit, because I remember Justin and I talking about this, you guys lost a lot of money on that first summit. Um, so I really want to understand the support and not only family, but obviously I think that'll be a lot for you guys since you were younger, but is how important was that support system to realize that we're not going to quit on this. We're going to keep going. We have something here. That was everything yeah. at the risk of rehashing, maybe some PTSD from a massive, massive net loss. Our first year in business. Um, we were only able Brian to shoot for the, for our wildest dreams and, and take a chance and, go through that experience because we had room to fail and we are very lucky. I want to acknowledge that for, for sure. Uh, I'm coming to you live from my childhood bedroom where I have relocated due to the current quarantine situation in New York. Um, and my parents, they always instilled in, in me the value of we have worked our lives. We've worked so hard to allow you Dylan to live a better life, right? We want you to pursue things greater than we have. And I'm so lucky for that. That is not the case for everybody. Um, and that is, I think my goal one day when I do raise a family and become a parent, that is what I would want for my children. And I'm so appreciative of them. Um, but we could suffer a massive setback and not have to put food on the table for, you know, a family per se. Um, and, and that freedom, I think is something I don't want to say young entrepreneurs, people getting started take for granted, but it is maybe not given the weight that it should be because your life changes when you have a family, your life changes when you are even paying rent or paying a mortgage. And things that you could do maybe 10 years ago now are off the table completely, right? You now can go from taking a gamble and working a year on a startup, and now maybe you can only spend a couple of hours a night working on your side hustle. And that's just a reality for a lot of people. And so when, when I think back to those early days, 
having the safety net of my education, my Duke University diploma that was coming my way in a few years, that allowed me and enabled me just even the mental headspace to take a risk, knowing that no matter what, I'd be okay. And that is something I'm truly, truly grateful for. What, uh, let, let's talk about, I, I won't call it a failure because obviously look where you are today with NextGen, but let's say that first event was like a, oh my gosh, we learned a lot. What was one of the biggest takeaways you had from that event coming out of it? That's a great question. And, and you know what? Calling it a failure wouldn't necessarily be unfair. I think that is accurate. And the best part is we learn way more from failures as anyone, as you do, um, than we do from successes. So had we hit it out of the park year one and made a lot of money, I bet you we wouldn't be where we are today, right? And that's kind of ironic in a lot of ways. Um, but the, the largest takeaway that we had from this three-day conference Brian, I, I kid you not, you've been to Next Gen events, you know the bar we try to set. Um, this was maybe the worst aesthetic conference of all time. During the first opening talk, I want you to picture this. Anybody listening, imagine the backdrop falling, like mid-speaker. That happened. That, that for sure happened. Uh, we had the most bare bones venue set up and, and all the, the jazz and nice bells and whistles you're used to seeing at a conference. We had none of those. But what we did have, Brian, fantastic people. We had 250 approximately stud A plus young early stage entrepreneurs who were chasing something greater than themselves, who were trying to build something that was going against the status quo, that was not the norm for, let's say, a 25 year old to be pursuing. Uh, but they didn't really care. And they said, I'm going to chase my dreams anyways. We got those people in a room, and it didn't matter that the backdrop fell. It didn't matter that it wasn't the, the nicest setup and that we ran over by maybe an hour and a half every single day um, because the people were right. And uh, that was the launching point for the, the roots of our online group, of our community as a whole and this network we're building. Um, there's a, I forget the exact phrase, but essentially your first 10 people, I think it was actually first told to me in the sense of a, a team hiring purposes, but I think it holds true in any network. Your first 10 people will multiply themselves times 10. And then those 100 people will also multiply themselves times 10. And so one day when you're at 10,000 and you, you ask yourself, how do we get here? And what happened to the quality of our people? Well, go back to the first 10, right? And if you didn't get those right, then how could you wonder? Of course, like attracts like. That's how things work. I'm going to tell the friend who I think is also going to enjoy this. But if it wasn't meant for me in the first place, then that friend shouldn't, you know, all these things cascade. Yeah. Um, and so we just really were lucky in a lot of ways that we got the right people that led us to where we are today. Well, you know, what's interesting. And, and if I, if I kind of make a correlation here, if that's the right word, my vocabulary is not the best, but the, uh, <laughs> the, you really was a, it was a startup, right? So I think having those younger entrepreneurs, people that were starting businesses, even though those hiccups that you had, they knew because they were going through those in their business, right? They didn't have it perfect. Unlike, again, going to some or having people that have been, you know, seasoned for 25 years in certain businesses, right? They expect it to be like perfect for whatever reason, not thinking back of like, this is how, this is how Amazon started, right? You know, everyone, everyone sees a picture of Bezos in his office or whatever, you know, that, you know, is going around the internet from the nineties. So like, I, I think that startup mentality is they probably realize that as well. Right. You know, definitely. And there's merit to that, right? There's a, there's a certain feeling you get when you hear that Steve jobs and, and Waz started Apple in a garage, right? You're like, yeah, that's awesome. I know that I, I've been there. And you resonate with that as a fellow entrepreneur. Now, maybe your garage is your, your childhood bedroom. Your childhood bedroom is this crappy venue in Austin, Texas that you put on your first event. It, we all have our version of that, but I'm with you. If we came out of the gates and had put on a $2 billion conference, right? Uh, I don't know how we would have pulled that off, but it wouldn't have been uh, on brand, I think in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, now we continue to grow and the quality of our products, of course, has grown with that and has met the, the needs and the desires of our entrepreneurs, or at least that's what we're chasing and we'll continue to. But I'm with you that uh, what, what great empire that you know of started off at the top. Right? The, the journey is the value in getting there because you, you never really arrived, right? Even Amazon today, I'm sure Bezos is saying, if he hears you say that in this interview, when he listens to just get started, he's going to say to himself, Brian, just wait for when they're sharing the photo of me today in Amazon in 2040, right? Mm -hmm. How great will that moment be? Right. And that feeling is so special. And I yeah. think that's what we, we love as entrepreneurs. 
Well, I think that, you know, that's why I've always centered around the, the just get started theme, because I think we all see, and especially now with social media, just how, you know, how instantaneous it is, right? Is we always forget, you know, I, obviously I've been just, just like a lot of the world has been watching, you know, the last dance, you know, about the bulls and, mm. you know, great documentary. I think they did a phenomenal job. But one of the things that, you know, is interesting is, and you could take Jordan, but you can probably take any player on that team. You know, you, you forget that they sat for hours and hours and hours in their backyard or in the gym shooting free right. throws or whatever. Um, I like how, you know, one of the things in one of the last episodes, like Steve Kerr was talking about, you know, to kind of take a bigger role because Michael was like wanting him to probably do that. So he spent extra time, he put in more energy and that paid off obviously, you know, in, in some game winning shops. So it's, you don't see that always, right. It's behind the, behind the curtain. It's not talked about, but that's where, that's where people get to a certain spot because they've gone through that, you know, those struggles. So anyways, I just want to put an exclamation point on the, uh, especially that first, uh, summit event. How, how far did, when you guys had that idea, right, you started and said, Hey, we're going to do this to actually the first summit. How, what was the Delta between that time? We committed to hosting a next gen summit event, October, 2014. So the fall of 2014, October, November, and then we first put the day in the calendar for June 2015. So what is that? October, November, January, February, March, seven April, months, May, yeah. seven, seven months, yeah. months. And then we moved the date <laughs> and hosted the first conference July 31st to August 2nd or July 30th, one of the two. Um, and so we actually had about, I'll you know, call it nine months of runway. Um, we moved the date, Brian, because we had zero attendees signed up. We had not even booked the venue. That's how, that's how much in shambles this thing was at the beginning, um, which I hope makes you appreciate what happened you know, in 2019 a little more. Um, but we, we had very little runway and there was a lot of work to be put in. Always a lot of work. But uh, we, we somehow got a, an MVP in the truest form up and uh, not the MVP like Michael Jordan MVP, the you know, minimal yeah. <laughs> viable product one. And that's what we ran with. I think we all have those stories. You know, it's so fu funny. It makes me remember... So I went to, uh, I didn't get to go to Duke University. I, <laughs> I went to- You're a, there now though. I, well, yeah. I, um, I went to a, a Methodist University, which is a great school. You know, I was in a, a, a PGM program. You know, I, I was a PJ professional for many years in a, in a past life. But anyways, the reason I mentioned that is there was a golf course that the students built in like the late nineties. We called it down back or whatever. So when I got there in the early 2000s and the course was like, you know, it was okay, but it wasn't great. And the, the running joke was always that the year that the new freshmen came in and they made any comments about the course, you always were like, well, you should have seen it a couple of years ago. You, right. you think it was bad now. You should have seen it three years ago. You know? So it's kind of funny. It's like, you're always going to get better. But yeah, those, those first few moments are always, uh, always interesting. So It makes you appreciate where, where you've come and full well knowing you have so much further to go. Uh, I love talking about 2014, 2015. At the time... I was ready to pull my hair out. Of course, but that's how it should be. And I, I full well know that will be the case in another five years, right? But thinking back how far we've come, um, one thing that I, I just was speaking with Justin, my partner about, as a founder, it's tough to find validation in your day-to-day, -day, right? If you are living in the business and it is your life in a lot of ways, as Next Gen HQ is for me, um, it, it's really hard to appreciate just how much gets done in even a week, but you need to think back because if you can't find that, those moments, those wins, and you, you don't have a chance to, I don't want to say celebrate them. You don't have to go out and throw a you know, massive party, but at least recognize them and spend a second reflecting on them. Then this road becomes really lonely and we, we don't have much to appreciate. It's tough to find fulfillment if you're not making Forbes under 30 every year, so to speak. Um, so that is one way that I think is truly powerful. Just reflecting on what the heck were we doing in 2015? And now, okay, we still don't really know what we're doing, but we have a much better idea and a lot of brilliant people working on it. How did you convince 250 people to come to Austin is what I want to know. <laughs> we begged. We sincerely, anything that we could do to get folks there. Um, we actually only had, I believe, maybe three or four paid tickets. The rest came for free. Um, so we, we sold them on the, the promise of, look, there are going to be a few hundred amazing people here. We had the best speaker lineup for young entrepreneurs that was out there. 
all people who were of that Forbes under 30 caliber, the Teal Fellow-esque type of entrepreneur, um, that was who we had presenting. So they were where we were pitching the audience members on, hey, you want to be there in two, three years? Come meet them. Come learn from them. Come hang out with them. And uh, that resonated with at least a few hundred people. Um, definitely did not resonate with a, a few hundred more, maybe a few thousand. Um, but then they came next. They came 2016, 2017. Uh, I, I get why you might not want to join up with an event or fly out to Austin, Texas when the event only has like a, a three-month-old website. I understand. So we, no hard feelings. If anybody did not come in 2015, you are more than welcome to come join anytime. We'd love to have you. I won't put you on the spot for the... Uh the potential fall summit that had to be changed. I won't, I won't put you on the spot in any dates right now, but I am curious. Big uh, things coming. Yes. That's exciting to hear. How did you juggle personally? Because obviously you went to Duke university, right? You came down my neck of the woods. Duke's a 15 minute drive away from me. Um, but then you were also running this and you were progressing this. How, how did you manage to do full school work, probably other extracurricular activities and run a business? It's really tough. Uh, there's no sugarcoating it, Brian. And what it really boiled down to for me was learning how to say no. Um, call that sacrifice, call that discipline. I think it's a bit of everything. But I had crazy ambitions when I got on campus at Duke to join every club, every student group, wanted to double major, minor, you name it, I wanted to do it, right? I wanted to have this full college experience. And I quickly realized that it would come at the cost of either my mental sanity or my sleep, or both, right? Or probably, probably most likely both. Um, and so I had to learn. I probably didn't figure it out my first year, but looking back, especially my sophomore year, I had to start saying no to opportunities. And that meant I might not be able to be part of the student government anymore. I might not be able to go to that fraternity event. I might not be able to partake in, in this various extracurricular activity you insert you know, above. Um, but if there were a few things I was passionate about, I could narrow them down and it would still require sacrifice. Don't get me wrong. Had I not been in university, I would have had much more time to spend on growing Next Gen HQ. Maybe we get a little bit farther, a little bit faster, but I also would have lost out on some of the experiences that came from my time on campus at Duke. Um, I loved my educational experience, my academic classes, but I learned so much more from just being surrounded by brilliant young people, meeting friends, uh, learning how to balance, right? how to say no. That's a skill that I apply debatably more than anything else today, right? Think about how much we have to focus as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. We have ample opportunity. Picking the one or two within next gen that we want to focus on, that's like the hardest thing in the world. I was now honing that muscle dating back four, five, six years. Um, so it, it's not easy. There's no formula. And it, it kind of stinks if you're listening as a college student who is also trying to grow a business. I'm sorry to tell you that you can't do it all. But there's also beauty in that because the things that you do choose to, to double down on, um, you can have really unlimited potential growth in those. Well, you mentioned, you know, kind of focusing, right? Saying no to stuff. Are there certain habits that you formed over the years that have helped you do some of that or have helped you kind of, whether it's, you know, personal growth or again, better mindset or whatever, anything that you're putting into play uh, that's been impactful? One mentor of mine in particular, Strauss Zelnick, who we had the uh, blessing to interview on one of our Next Gen Live webinars recently, uh, he was telling me about his personal value system and how he, every so often, at I think frequent intervals, I'm not sure if he actually times it or schedules it, but he revisits his values and asks himself, um, what is he looking to achieve, right? And these are high level, meaningful, deep, insightful, all the things. They're not oh, I'm, I'm looking to lose two pounds, right? They might be um, a fitness lifestyle regimen and routine um, at, at a, you know, one layer removed from that. And he has a notes app on his phone with his values. And whenever he's making a decision, he references the, this, this app. And he basically says, what do my values tell me is the right way? I, in my clear, thoughtful process, have determined that this is my playbook, right? These values. And so I have my playbook. Let's go plug it in and get the answer. I think th that process in just determining your values is where the merit lies. And then the execution of it is kind of like just a for an afterthought at that point. Um, but what I have tried to do is think about what are my values? What are my core values that drive my life or that I want to be driving my life? Is it family? Is it my relationships with friends? Is it 
ambitions, money, fame, you name, whatever it might be. And then if I can feel really good about those, at least today, you know, in, in this May, in 2020, this date, um, then I, I, I feel pretty good about making the right decision and I won't regret it. Now, I might not always make the right decisions, but at least I'll know that I did my very best with the information I had available to, to plan my life in the, the way that I think I deserve. Yeah. Dude, you seem like you're so confident. You got this confident swagger about you. And every time I see you, it, just, it just exudes from you. Have you always been confident or have you, have, is this something you've learned over the years? I'm, I'm, I don't know. I really appreciate you saying that, Brian. I, uh, I think that I was blessed to have, a, again, talk about family, a really great family foundation and early friendships that um, I don't want to say inspired me to you know, pursue greatness in any way, but uh, let me know that it's okay to, to just be me. And I feel at home, I think it's also a credit to you and, and how you make a guest feel in just a, on the interview. Um, but I really appreciate you saying that. And uh, one thing that has helped me is thinking about presence. Um, so through meditation practice, through uh, really just any type of, of mental focus, you talk about focus again, I have found such a tremendous um, benefit or result from just being present in this conversation. I used to, and I think back to me, even only a few years ago, I'd be in this conversation talking to you, like eyeing my phone, kind of peeking at my email, waiting for a Slack notification pop up. And you could tell, or you could tell when someone's mind is elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And what's the point? Like, am I going to be extra productive because of that? No. And you're going to not feel as great. I'm going to come off as someone who's probably a little bit of a jerk. I don't want that. You don't want that. And so I really just make a concentrated effort to be present in whoever I'm talking to, whatever I'm doing. And I think that manifests and maybe comes across as confident sometimes. Um, but I, I feel really good and I'm truly blessed. I, uh, I am grateful to, to be able to say that. Well, so obviously you talked to a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of folks that, you know, aspire to be a lot of younger um, folks, obviously with Next Gen HQ. I, you know, I'm curious about passion. This comes up a lot. Mm -hmm. Right. And is passion enough? You know, is it what gets you kind of moving forward when you have a bad day or things aren't maybe the partnership, you know, you know, went through or didn't go through that you guys were trying to bring on or something like that? Because obviously you can be passionate, but at some point, you know, there, there's those times where things just don't go as you planned. Is that enough for people? What or what would you, you know, kind of say is some different things that you're driving force besides just passion? What a fantastic question, Brian. Um, for me, in my experience, I think passion is certainly part of the equation. I hesitate to say that it is the end-all be-all. And I only say that because um, I feel like I'm a very passionate guy. And I know that at times, my passion alone has not been enough to, let's say, maintain my drive and my commitment. Um, there have been other aspects, whether that is sometimes responsibility, right? people counting on me. Or that could be purpose and feeling like this is part of a larger journey and that I'm, I'm meant to experience this, this failure. Um, faith, I think, is another thing that comes to mind. But really what it boils down to, it comes back to the values in a lot of ways. And one of mine is a, a long-term mentality. I really try whenever possible to remove, I don't want to say from you know, getting grounded in the day today, in this week, but uh, not to weight it so heavily that it impacts my longer term decisions, right? We all have bad weeks. I, I just said two minutes ago that I feel really blessed and grateful. I just like everyone else have bad days. They become bad weeks, right? Now, if it's a bad week or two weeks or a month, then I really got to start paying attention. Um, but if I'm longer term changing my behaviors because of a really bad conversation or because let's say that deal didn't go through, I think that's a problem. I think that um, now I, I don't want to say you don't optimize for the day to day because you got to keep the lights on in your business. You got to keep operations flowing. Um, but if you can remove a little bit and weight the 20 year vision more highly than you are this 20 minute conversation, that's going to yield benefits for you. It's also going to give you freedom to operate as you want to. Right? I think it's a lot of uh, Simon Sinek's infinite game. He just wrote that book last year, I believe. And anybody who's not familiar with this style of thinking, just read that and you'll get it. Um, but long-term gives you freedom, gives you flexibility. It gives you permission to screw up in the short term. Who doesn't want that? Well, let me ask you this about, I want to go back to you and Justin, because 
this has come up a few times recently and it's been around relationships more like husband wife duos that are working together but i'm actually really curious from a co-founder standpoint you know you guys have been doing this for six years ish right how do you maintain trust and communication this goes back to simon sinek kind of trust and communication in in really uh, top-notch relationships how do you guys continue to maintain that um, so that you are on the same wavelength if you will yeah. each and every day as you go forward it is the most important thing uh, i am so so blessed justin is an absolute blessing in my life and um, the the ability to lean on somebody debatably more than yourself at times is uh, one of life's greatest uh, passions for me and, and one of my greatest growth opportunities. And we work at that every day. Um, now, I'm not gonna sit here and tell you that we take you know, a, a therapy course or that we are constantly talking about how we're treating each other, but we do make the time when necessary. And ideally speaking, that's before there's a problem. And we're, we're really fortunate to say that we have not had um, many big disagreements. We have had countless business discussions. I don't want to say disagreements, but different viewpoints. Um, you can call them arguments. They might look like one if someone came into a, a, let's say a whiteboarding session in the middle of a Tuesday afternoon and they see us not yelling, but you know, being pretty, pretty forceful in our ideas. Um, whenever that happens, I zoom out and I really ask myself, okay, Justin's bringing to the table a completely different idea or solution here. I know a bajillion percent that my idea is better, but let, let me think about where he's coming from. Does he want what's best for the company? Yes, he does. Is he just maybe thinking about it from a different angle? Yeah, probably. All right, great. Then I'm not going to be upset with him. I'm still going to go to bat for my idea and talk about merit and talk about the reasons and the logic, but I'm never going to take it to that personal level. And I think whenever I, at least in my experience in my networking, learned of or read about a co-founder relationship that falters, it's nine out of 10 times because it became personal. And there was a disagreement of sorts or somebody wanted to go one way, another one wanted to go a different way and they brought it to the personal level. Um, so if Justin called me tomorrow and said, Dylan, I want to completely pivot our largest product and do something so different, I might tell him he's crazy, but I'm not gonna say, Justin, you yourself are, are, are an idiot, right? I'm not gonna accuse him. Um, it might be just his, the, the idea that might not be there. So distinguishing between what his motivations are and what we're actually talking about, I think is so powerful. And by the way, as a disclaimer, if it wasn't already obvious, Justin very hardly rare are, are not great ideas. Everything that that guy spits out is, is truly a 10 out of 10. Um, we're talking about like the 1% of 1% that maybe are not aligned. Uh, but it, it is such a, a blessing that I have a partner that we don't have to be together. We don't take calls together anymore, Brian. It is like once a week that we're on a call together, not a one-on-one -on -one meeting, of course. And that is freedom at its finest because I know that he's running his business and his operations, if not the same, better than I would be if I were in his place. And he feels that way too. And so we are like two people. We kind of cloned ourselves and imagine how much more productive we are now that we can do that. Well, who, so I got to ask the like, how do you, you guys are like butting heads, like on an idea, how, what wins? What, how, how does that work? That's a great question. Sometimes the answer is that we realize we're at an impasse and we have to pause. Um, there have been very few high level core decisions that we have disagreed upon. Um, and, and honestly, I'm struggling to think of a, a major one right now. But on the minor, more day-to-day -day side, um, we, we realize that not every battle is worth dying on your sword. Right? And like any relationship, whether it's a friendship, a, a you know, marriage, a girlfriend, boyfriend, you name it, you have to sacrifice. I talked about sacrifice in the sense of your commitments, but you have to sacrifice in relationships too. We all know that, whether it's mom and dad, you name it. Um, so if it's about you know the name of what we want to call a, the, the spotlight in our roundup, how we share our community members, and he's got a really good idea that he feels passionate about. And I kind of like my idea and I think it's better, but I'm not that passionate about it. Am I going to really impact our relationship over that? No, right? That, that's foolish. And I think everybody out there would agree. Um, maybe with the exception of any Steve Jobs fanatics, because he definitely would go to, go to bat for that. Um, but there's a merit to that too. So uh, this is what we do, right? We sacrifice, we, um, we talk about it, and we let each other know we're honest. And I might not say in the moment that, hey, 
I didn't love how you maybe handled this thing, but I will tell him tomorrow, two days later, three days later, because it requires constant work to get a relationship to really function and thrive on the highest level. Yeah. And let, let me ask you one more question on that is how do you guys divvy up the responsibilities? Um, like, is there certain things like, obviously you guys have a tremendous team there that you've built at, at next gen HQ. Do you both go in on the hiring process or are there certain business decisions he handles versus you? How, how do you guys split that up? How did you determine that? You hit the nail on the head to start and it's worth emphasizing. We can only talk about splitting things up and, and giving up tasks because our team is so tremendous. Uh, we have such A plus entrepreneurs and, and leaders and, and movers and shakers who are dedicating their time to work on Next Gen HQ's mission. That is honestly the honor of a lifetime and my most grateful part of being an entrepreneur to get to work alongside some of these, these individuals. Um, but in terms of Justin and myself, we have carefully outlined what decisions we both will make together. Things like fundraising, hiring, um, some other high level, high leverage aspects that we both as executives will come together and, and ideate on. Um, but we've also set out what Justin will focus on and doesn't need to loop Dylan in always. And what Dylan will focus on and doesn't need to be looping with Justin. And that's not at all because I don't maybe want to be involved in those conversations. I probably do but it's just not feasible. And we couldn't be leveraging each other constantly if we also wanted the benefit of dividing and conquering in a lot of ways. So we were just very intentional about it, Brian. We set out from the, the early onset of um, this style of, of working and operating to get on the same page and say, okay, Dylan, what do you wanna be involved with? Justin, what do you wanna be involved with? And put the guidelines in paper and in place. And that way we know, okay, this is something that, you know what, if I want Justin's opinion, he's always here. But if I feel pretty good about it, I'm going to move forward. And 99 out of 100 times, it works the same way it would have had we both been involved in everything together. All right, I'm going to get you out of this note because I know we can chat for five more hours, but uh, we'll have you back for a part two. Deal. I want you to go back Locking to it. I want you to go back to 17 year old Dylan. All right, so you got to turn. You got to get back the, in the way back machine. No mustache and, there. Yeah, there you. <laughs> You got to write something to your 17, 18 year old self. The caveat though, which makes it a little fun is you only have a post-it note. What would you share as a, a really solid piece of advice or insight for that young person um, to help them along a little bit easier than you've had it? That's a great question and such a powerful um, uh, brain brainstorm. And it brings up so many great memories, Brian. I think my post-it would essentially say, it's a long game. Don't be in a rush. Don't be in a hurry. And I talked about the, the infinite game, the infinite mindset, long-term mentality. But to a 17, 18-year-old, college seems like the end-all be-all, right? When you graduate college, if you haven't made it by then, what are you doing with your life, man, right? Um, here today, I'm still only 24. I have so much life ahead of me. And I can't wait to get there. But I don't want to rush and forget kind of the journey that got me there in the first place. So 17, 18 year old Dylan, it's a long game. Don't worry if you haven't accomplished all of your life's ambitious goals, audacious goals by the time you're, you're 24, 25, or goodness forbid, 35. Um, we're going to get there. And you keep doing you, put one foot in front of the other, never stop learning, get 1% better each day. I guarantee you any goal you set forth out to achieve will be accomplished. Very well said, Dylan. Where, where can everyone find uh, Next Gen HQ? Where's the best place to connect? Catch us online at nextgenhq.com. There you can join our Roundup newsletter, which is the best way to stay in the loop. We drop weekly resources, updates on the community, various opportunities to get you involved with from hiring to speaking engagements, you name it. Um, and then you can also find my email there. I'm just Dylan at nextgenhq.com. Would love to meet anybody and chat about ways that we can support you. This has been a lot of fun, man. I'm glad to have you on. Long time coming and appreciate you spending the time. Brian, thank you so much. This has been an absolute joy. You are a joy. The, the man, the myth, the legend with the voice that was meant to run a podcast, but also the face for TV. So you got the whole package. <laughs>